Hello and welcome to the Sparkle and Thrive podcast. This is your host, Joy Foster, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Joe Tuchner Sharp, the founder of Scamp and Dude. Now, Joe and I have sat on a panel before and we got to know each other briefly. Of course, you know I love Scamp and Dude because for all of our podcast episodes that are filmed live, I wear Scamp and Dude. It's one of my favorite, 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 favorite clothing companies. It's ex- extremely comfortable and especially in these times where we are at home and we want to be comfortable it's the perfect clothing uh so joe welcome to the show i'm delighted that you're here thank you thank you for having me um we have been uh really excited about this series of podcasts and you're going to be kicking it off uh we've just been finishing a series of podcasts on earn what you're worth and then we did uh, a series on social media trends and now we're going to be interviewing people who have made it, you know, in the sense of however different people view making it uh, in different industries and how they have marketed the, their product. And you are in the clothing industry and you have an extremely incredible story that's behind the product that you make. So I want to talk about your story first, but I also want to dive into how you got started with marketing that product, your clothing products in the early days and what you're doing now and how that's transformed over time. So let's just start by telling your story because it's an incredibly heart-wrenching story. Uh, Tell us more about why you got into the business you're in uh, and what drives you every day. Okay, so I, my previous career was um, public relations. So I was head of press for Tom Ford Beauty and Estee Lauder and then set up my own PR company which I ran for eight years um, looking after beauty brands like NARS, Topshop Makeup, Cowshed, Declior, loads and loads of beauty brands and so, uh, so I guess marketing and PR was it was my whole career I was like 20 years shaping brands and putting brand strategies together and PR campaigns um, and I was in the middle of selling my shares. So I'd had my second child and I was in the middle of selling my shares in my company. I wanted to do something else. I decided I wanted a brand. I didn't know at that point it was going to be a beauty brand because my background was in the beauty industry. So I was going to start a skincare brand. Um, and I was in the middle of selling my shares. And it was if anyone's exited themselves from their own business before, it's it's really hard. It's horrible. I mean, it's it's partly hard because it's a really kind of emotional decision to leave what you've created from scratch. Um, And also whether you're doing the right thing to actually step away. And and also, you know, you're dealing with accountants and and lawyers, and it's like a battle to work out how much your shares are worth. And it's confrontational and it's not, it's just not a nice position to find yourself in. So, I ended up with this spasm in my face and I'd gone to the doctors and said, What's, what is this? It's like, it, was re- it wasn't just like a twitch. It was quite a big spasm. And he said, you're so stressed. You're dangerously stressed. You need to just, whatever you're doing, stop it because you're going to make yourself ill. So I wrapped it all up and just kind of you know, accepted what it was and went, fine, I'm just, I've just got to get out, get out of this. So um, sold up, walked away and moved on and started planning this um, skincare brand that I was launching and then suddenly one day I had the most terrible headache it was like I was being stabbed in the head it was absolutely horrendous and this eye had to close and I went to the doctors and they said they thought it was meningitis so they said get straight to the hospital and the hospital also thought it was meningitis and started treating me for meningitis put me in a room on my own did um, a CT scan and then at one in the morning, I was asleep. A doctor woke me up and said, um, I just I just need to ask you, have you got any cancer, in, um, any history of cancer in your family? Because we found a lump in your brain and you've had a brain hemorrhage. And it was one of those absolute life changing moments where you're just like, what? And I didn't, you know, you're not sure if you're actually dreaming. I'm like, is this actually happening? And then she just checked around for lumps and checked my nymphs and walked out. And I was like, oh, my God, and now I've got to lie here all night knowing I've got a lump on my brain and I've had a brain hemorrhage. And my kids were one and three at the time. And the thought of leaving them without a mum was just all I could think about. And I just laid there all night in the, this dark room just thinking about what could happen and whether I was going to be all right. And it was horrible. 
Um, anyway, to cut a long story short from, from that, we didn't know what, what it was, this lump. It could have been a cancerous brain tumour or it could have been a cavernoma, which is a cluster of abnormal blood cells. Either way, it's not nice, um, nice thing to have. And my surgeon suggested the best things to remove it because if it was the cluster of abnormal blood cells, it, it will hemorrhage. If it's hemorrhaged once, it's going to hemorrhage again and next time could be fatal. So I booked in for the surgery and I booked in, it, this all happened in the October and it was about November by the time we decided that yes, this is what the best thing to do was. And I wanted to have one last Christmas with my family if it was going to be my last Christmas because you're facing brain surgery. You don't know if you're going to come out. It's a pretty, they're, <laughs> they're putting knives in your brain. It's a kind of, it's a terrifying prospect. So I booked in for January the 4th so that I could have Christmas with my parents and my husband and my sisters and my um, children. And in the run-up, there was this, uh, I kept thinking, kept having this feeling of, uh, have I done enough have I done enough good? Like it's it's weird. You assess your whole life because I thought that that, that my life might end on January the fourth. It you you look at everything. It's what it's what people say about the pearly gates, and it's totally true. You do go there. You do go. Your life flashes before you, and you say, "Am I proud of everything I've done?" And I knew I'd been a good person, and a good daughter, and a good wife, and a good friend. But had I really helped? Had I made a difference to lots of people's lives to help people? And, I didn't even really realise that was important to me until that moment. But I, I knew I hadn't. I, I could remember that I'd done a, a 10K run once when my dad was poorly and raised £2,000 for cancer research. And that's all I could really think of that I'd done that was a little bit good. Um, and I just had this overwhelming feeling that if I make it through this surgery, I'm going to, it's, I'm going to dedicate my next career is going to be all about helping people, giving back, making a difference to people's lives. And that's, and I felt, OK, I will do that. If I if I wake up, I'm going to do that. So fast forward to the surgery, um, saying goodbye to the kids. And my parents, my husband was just still making me feel emotional now thinking about it. Um, but I came out, came through the surgery and had 10 days in hospital then because this side of my head was shaved. I had was cut from here to here, 20 staples. It, I looked like Frankenstein and my kids just could not see me like that. I felt it just would literally haunt them forever if they'd seen it. So I had 10 days without them and that I'd never been apart from them for more than like two days before. So it was really hard. And I was really worried about them and how they were feeling without me as well. And where they were thinking, well, where's mummy gone? And Jude was one, like I said. Um, Sonny was three, so he it it was it was not it wasn't great. And I all I kept thinking was I wish I could have given them a little superhero to watch over them. And then I came up in my mind with these toys that I thought they could be like little cuddly toy superheroes. And what about on the back if it was a pocket? And I could have put my photo. So I could have said, this superhero is going to watch over you. But mummy's still here on the back. And that I kept going over that in my head thinking, God, I wish that had been available to buy. I would have bought it for them. And, and then I thought, well, God, maybe I can make them. And I could donate one for every one soul to a child who loses a parent, because that's what I was worried about, leaving my kids without a mum. So this little idea was bubbling away when I was there in the hospital of these superheroes. And then when I left hospital and was starting the kind of the recovery process, I my mind was going crazy about these superheroes. And, and then I started taking it a little bit further, thinking... I wanted my slogan to be a superhero has my back. So you're telling kids that a superhero is watching over them if they're going to nursery or they're going to school or they're going for a sleepover. Anytime they're away from you, you can say they can have a T-shirt on with a, a superhero has my back written on the back or you give them their little superhero to take with them and they've just got some comfort. So that's how it started. So in the March, I registered the name Scamp and Dude. I had the surgery in the January. March, I'd obviously thought of enough to think okay, this is what it's going to be. And I named it Scamp and Dude as a little nod to my kids. It was being apart from them that inspired me to create the brand. So Scamp is a little nod to Sonny because I've always called him Scamp. And Dude is a little nod to Jude. And they're very proud that they're, that's their names, which is very sweet. And then I started getting carried away with the designing process. So when I started, first of all, it was just going to be T-shirts. Then I started 
be thinking, well, I need sweatshirts. And then I started thinking, originally I was just thinking, well, just, I'll just put my the slogan, a superhero has my back on the back and maybe the little dinosaur here. And then I got so carried away with designing and, and coming up with ideas. And then I thought, I want, I want a superpower infused leopard print. So that's why our leopard print, which is like our signature print, you can see it here, has um, lightning bolts in it. So it, it, it's animal prints mixed with superpower infused animal prints. And then, and then I came up with the idea of having a superpower button. This is our superpower button. So this neon pink bolt <laughs> is on absolutely everything. And it, it was first launched for kids because we started off as a kids brand. Um, but it's now used as much by adults <laughs> as I talk about the superhero bolt all the time. You know, like whenever I need a bit of courage, I just I and it's it's um it's embroidered in, yeah. So you can really feel the 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 text the texture of it. I love it. So it's about pressing it to get your uh, burst of superpowers whenever you want it. And our swing tags give examples of what those superpowers might be. So the kids ones are things like expert fairy finder and bunny whisperer and super cool shapeshifter and then the adults ones are things like um expert disco um kitchen disco raver and um sleep for a week and patience of a saint things like that so, now patience of a saint i need to tap tap I, out a bit more often <laughs> yeah that's a definite one for me um so they are the superpower button and the prints and then i just got was just loved the designing process so much of coming up with a collection and and as I said, it started off as a kid's brand and I just created two adult sweatshirts because when I got the samples of the kids ones, I loved them so much. I wanted to wear them. So I thought I'm going to make some adults ones. And then we launched into Liberty. So that was another amazing moment in the story was it was probably about June time. And I got a DM on Instagram saying from the one of the head buyers at um, Liberty. And it was a message saying, um, hi Joe, I've heard that you're launching a brand and I'd love to talk to you about it. Now she was the head buyer of beauty and I think she, Whisperer got out that I was doing a skincare brand. So I messaged back and said, oh, I'm not doing the skincare brand anymore. Um, it's actually kids wear. And she replied, well, as fate would have it, I'm now head of kids and beauty. Wow. Like, oh, my goodness, like tingle, tingle. Um, so I went to meet her at Liberty and I didn't have any samples to show her. All I had was a presentation that showed all the designs, told the brand story, showed the look and feel of the brand. And she, I could see as I was telling her the story, her eyes were welling up and I was thinking, God, I think she, maybe she likes it if, if her eyes are watery. And then she said at the end, she said, I absolutely love it. I will take it all. And wow. that was one of the best moments throughout this whole thing where I just was like, oh, my goodness. And I tried to act very cool. And when she was telling me how many she wanted of things, like the sleep buddies, for example, how many she wanted of those? And it was more than I'd ordered total. And what she wanted, I needed twice that because for every one soul, we donate one to a child in need. So I was like, quickly need to ring the factory and say like quadruple the order. Um, and I walked, I was acted very calm and collected and then walked out and walked down the stairs of Liberty and started crying. And I was <laughs> bawling and bawling and bawling and went outside and rang my parents and rang my husband and just went oh my goodness they want it they believe in it they that's amazing they in liberty and I was just oh it was amazing amazing moment um well I, <laughs> I'm in tears uh Kate <laughs> Profferman's watching as well and she said that it's making her cry oh. um so I think it's you know this is such an emotional story which is why I wanted to share it because everyone needs to hear a story like this everyone needs to hear a story of someone who faced adversity at the most extreme level and then allowed themselves to think about a an alternative, you know, and to think about a different way to view the, the same story, right? So I think there's so many people that could have had this exact same situation and, and had a completely different reaction to it. So I think um, first and foremost, it just shows that um, that in a dark situation there can be hope, and that actually that hope can can really propel you forwards. Um, so let's talk about what it was like. Uh, okay, obviously you you were you had this relationship, and that was amazing for getting things off the ground. 
Um, but what was it like marketing in the early days, you know, setting up, uh, setting up your Instagram account, um, your other social media accounts, I'm assuming in the early days, that was all you, cause that's usually how it goes. So it's still all me. I'm still doing all the social media and I'm just about to change that because I'm just starting to sink a little bit. And I, I mean, it's not all me as in the brand isn't all me now. I have a brilliant team, but when it comes to the social media, that's been something that stayed under, under my remit. And I've just literally after Christmas, I just said, I can't do this anymore. And I think like, it's it's the answering the DMs and people get annoyed if I don't answer. And I'm like, I'm trying, I'm really trying and trying to stay on top of it all. And and I just think I need a bit a bit of help now with that. But when we when we first launched, I mean it was it's quite daunting to open a, an Instagram account and you have zero followers and you you start seeding out and you start and I had my personal Instagram. So I had my my community on there that I was going, go go and follow my new venture over here, please. And, you know, my mum followed and things like that. So you can have you've got your family helping and and but it built really quickly. For those of you who are watching live, I've pulled it up on the screen. So I do want to point out you have one hundred and eighty nine thousand followers and you have been managing it from when it was zero. So <laughs> and I, I want to talk about how it, it's grown. But. This is a huge uh, accomplishment, first and foremost, in the social media world to be able to have a an account a that big, but b to have managed that yourself while you're also building the business. Um, so, so one of the things you did, so you went, you had a personal account, and then you were encouraging people to go and follow your business account. Yeah, and then I had I'm, I put a lot of effort when we launched into, and obviously my background in PR helped massively with. Um, press coverage when we launched. So that would also drive people. I mean, we had a double page spread in the Times and we were featured in Vogue and we had a lot of press coverage. So I think that helped drive people. Also, I made a, a conscious effort to, before I launched Scamp and Do, get to know the mummy influencers. So I knew I was going in, at, like I said, originally when we launched, it was a kid's brand now. 80% of our brand is actually adults. And our adults collection has absolutely skyrocketed but when we first launched it was kids so I wanted to get to know all the mummy um, bloggers and the mummy influencers and I joined I started hanging out with the there's a, a like a club called Mother's Meeting and if there's any any mums out there it's a great one to get involved with I mean when we were allowed to get together they'd put on events and you could go and network with people and I met a lot of really great people who believed in what I was doing, loved the story behind the band, loved the clothes, and I'd gift them sweatshirts to wear and they'd help get the word of mouth by wearing them. And that really helped massively. As you can see there, Peppa Pig's mum's actually worn our clothes as Mummy Pig. <laughs> there we go, Peppa Pig's mum. Pig wearing a scamp and dude. <laughs> so good. So I think it's I mean it's been it's it's taking taken a lot of work and a lot of effort to um, get to this point with the Instagram. And I have actually really loved doing it and really enjoyed doing it. And one one big thing I, I would say is not to call. I never call my community followers like when when you say followers, it feels like they're just following you. And I always call mine my community because they're part of it. And you'll see the latest post I put up was asking them what color tracksuit they want next. and they're all part of it's like a club and they're all part of this club they're not just following what I do they're part of it and I'll often put polls up saying I just posted that before the the electric blue tracksuit me in the tracksuit I literally posted that before I came on air with you just saying which do you what what color do you want me to do next and I'll often put polls up on stories as well like this is a new this is a new hoodie that we've got with a little to spread some positivity i'll just show you the back as well oh look at that i love it so Thanks. just for those of you listening she's um she's got a new uh tracksuit that's got it's like a smile on the back but one eye is a star and the other eye is uh My bolts. which is um, <laughs> so great i love that so superpower and the star, the, the yeah. star power which of course we love star power positivity and making you smile and i think when i first um, had this made up I I had I'd done one smiley face with two lightning bolts and I'd done one smiley face with one lightning bolt and one star which looked like it was winking and I I loved that one but I thought I want to know what my community won so I put a poll up on stories and said what do you want because 
I often do that with things and go, which do you like best and what do you want? Because I'm making it for them as much. I mean, I'm also making it for myself <laughs> because I'll, I always make what I want to wear. Um, but I love having their input and their opinions and, and them telling me what they want. Because and when I'm designing, I'll often say, right, guys, what do you want? I'm, I'm just starting spring, summer. What do you want me to do? And then it helps me because I'll think, oh, OK, yeah, I hadn't thought of towels. I'll I'll look into making some towels or it's a collaborative. And I think then they really feel part of the brand as well, which is important because they are. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And I love how you you phrase that, that they're not follow they're not followers, they're my community. And yeah. you know, and you want you're building this for them. And that's so important. And I think I think people, I mean, I have to say, you know, as Instagram's evolved, I initially never saw it as a community. Um, you know, place to go for community, but it 100% is, you know, uh, you, you, you get drawn into the accounts where you feel that there's a personal relationship, don't you? And mm. so that community is very, very important. And of course, um, you know, once you've worn Scamp and Dude, like you're like, you'll never go back to anything else because it's so comfortable. Um, so I just, I, but I love the fact that it's not about the followers, it's about the community and that's what builds it up. We did a, um, an Instagram interview with, um, Nicole Burke, who's a friend of mine who runs Kitchen Garden Academy. It was one of our very first, uh, first episodes, episode 25. And, uh, she talks about your community and she talks about growing an engaged community and, you know, in a very short period of time, she grew really fast as well. And it really, it really was about thinking about her community as a village, you know? So how would we do things? How would we, you know, how would the mayor show up in the village? And, you know, um, what kind of parties would we have and things like that? And I, I really love the way that she talked about that. So um, that's, you know, if you're interested in another a very successful business owner, multi-million pound business owner, um, I would definitely go check out um, episode 25 to, you know, learn a little bit more about building that community on Instagram. So, um, so the early PR helped a lot and c treating your community uh, like a community and not like followers that, you know, you're trying to pitch something at, but actually getting them involved in the process was really important to you. Um, and, and now you're at a stage where it's gotten quite big and actually you need some help, uh, in supporting you with that. Um, and I think that's probably the right move. Have you also, um, explored paid advertising or was it always organic? No, we started doing paid advertising on Facebook and Instagram. Oh, maybe coming on a year ago, maybe not quite a year. Um, but it has made a big difference. It has been very successful when it comes to finding new customers and and for sales as well. I mean, it's it's definitely been a good thing to do. Um, also, I think we have worked a lot with influencers, and I have another little side side job which isn't happening this year because well, might happen a bit later. Which is I work with the Brit Awards. And I've done it for 14 years. This will be my 15th year doing it. Where, so it's a, a kind of throwback from my beauty days where I used to set up a spa backstage at the at the Brits. And when I sold my PR company, I'd said to them, oh, I'll, well, I'll carry on doing that because it was my idea to, to do a spa backstage. And it was like my ba it was another one of my babies. And I was like, I'm going to take that one with me. And also it's been great for Scamp and Do because whenever I'm there running the spa, I can then also, I've, I've worked with the Brits for so long that they've been very kind and let me then put some Scamp and Dude in all the dressing rooms. So all of those top musicians have had um, Scamp and Dude sweatshirts and it's just awareness of the brand and knowing who we are. And that first year, so we literally, I launched in the November and the February came and I put a sweatshirt in Robbie Williams's and Sleep Buddy for his two Sleep Buddies for his kids. He had two at the time, I think. And his one of his his people came to me and said he absolutely loves it and he really loves your story. And the next thing I know, he posted a picture on Instagram of him in my sweatshirt that I'd given him. And I was that was a oh my goodness moment because we were what, three months in of launching. And also, I was a huge Take That fan. So to me, to see Robbie, you know, I was like, this is the moment. This is amazing. 
<laughs> it's so funny. I, I'm a big fan of, of the Duchess of Cambridge. And when and I send her a letter, you know, an update her every once in a while on what we're doing. Because I, you know, she cares massively for children's mental health, and I care massively for women's mental health. And actually, the two go hand in hand because often children's mental health is affected by women's mental health. But um, I, the, I learned my lesson though. You can't send them any gifts because I got this lovely letter back saying thank you so much for your. I sent her one of our notebooks, which um, our notebooks are. They say be brave and sparkle, and um, <clears throat> they have the person's name on it. So I sent her a notebook and she sent it back. Oh. Um, but but you know it's one of those things where you know and it wasn't it wasn't to get the publicity, but it was to say you know I you know I really appreciate the work that you're doing um, mm -hmm. and. I, you know, and I think it's really lovely when you can do that. And of course, people do get gifts all the time. So when they accept them and then they not only accept them, but post them on Instagram, I mean, that really elevates your profile. And those situations can really change the game. We, we had that situation where the prime minister came and spoke to us and then name dropped us on national television. Wow. And in a single day, we got more hits on our website than we had in the previous year. And then it took us a whole like two years to get that level of traffic to the website again. Wow. So, you know, I know that that makes a huge difference. Well, Robbie, Robbie didn't actually um, tag us, so he didn't say the name of our brand, so it didn't make a difference, a big difference to us, because he didn't say who it was. But to me personally, it did, and and then also I shared his picture, which then he was wearing. So it obviously would have been better if he'd said, "This is a scampi do sweatshirt," or tagged us. But sadly, that didn't happen. Well, and also it's tricky because like they have uh, very often they'll have contracts and deals where they get paid to do that, and then if they're not yeah. getting they have to be careful we yeah we we've seen that happen with proviz um which is a, a sportswear brand that i worked with for a while where someone would do a picture of them wearing it but not tag it because they actually don't have an, a, con a contract or an endorsement or whatnot but just the fact that they're wearing it's such a huge yeah, exciting so when you did explore paid advertising um you know I, at that point you've done the organic for a while so how long was it where you had been doing just organic, uh, organic posting and, you know, building up that email list um, before you then started introducing the paid? So I think three years. So we're four years old now. So I think we did three years of just organic um, social. And then, yeah, after three years, we started doing the paid as well. But what I mean, I just remember then talking about the, the, what the impact um, some things can have. I think probably the most followers we got in one night was after we were copied by a large supermarket chain. They used our trademarked slogan, a superhero has my back, on the back of a pair of pajamas, which was totally heartbreaking to see what well, you just literally, I mean, it's so hard launching your own business. You work harder than, oh my goodness, it's been a really intense few years and you're working so hard. And before you've got a team, you know, you're, you're exhausted. And, um, to see them just do it like that so blatantly and it, it was it was it was bad and we weren't really getting very far with the lawyers and them they were they were basically saying oh okay we'll pull it but that was that was it and we were like hold on no so um I did a little social media campaign where I just put up our slogan a picture of our slogan and just said please can you share this and I called them out and said no this is it's not right you can't take smaller brands um share to say you, you don't believe this is right and they need to listen and la la it got shared like absolute crazy and loads of my influencer friends were sharing it and celebrities were sharing it and we got so did you have the two side by side is that how you had created it that's how i did it for the first um the first time i told everyone what was going on but when i asked them to share it it was just my image of my slow of the slogan on the back of a sweatshirt on a, a bit of a kid's head and I got 10,000 new followers in one evening just from that happening. I remember I was in Marrakesh doing um, one of our shoots, photo shoots. And my friend has a house up there and I was staying with her and we were having dinner. And I was so stressed about the legal thing that was going on with, with them. And I was like, just wanting them to take note. And, and I said, right, I'm going to do this and, and posted it. And then we were all sat around this dinner table and I was going, oh, my God, so, so shared it. Oh, my goodness, so, so share it. And you just saw the numbers coming up and up and up and I woke up the next morning and I was like oh my goodness we have 10,000 new members of our community thanks to that little sharing and I also my lawyer had a call from them first thing the next day to say fine okay let's sort this out 
you know, social media is so important. It makes such a difference. It makes people actually go, okay, you, you feel like you've got, you've got a voice. Yeah, that's 100% true because I think prior to social media, you didn't have a voice and then they could just shut you down. There was no evidence. The other thing too is it's evidence, you know, right? If you've got, if you've got your, your slogan and that's been out, uh, out there for years and then it is stolen, which does happen. And, you know, and they think, well, you're a little guy. You can't, you can't, mm -hmm. you don't have the strength. But actually, if you do have the strength in your community, not your following, but if you have the strength in your community, yeah. you know, that your community will back you up. And that makes a huge, huge difference. Um, yeah, it was interesting. We had a situation where, um, cause we have a hashtag, hashtag tech pixies, which is our hashtag. Cause that's the name of our company. Uh, and we had some people that were using it to access our community. And I just sent them private messages and just said, Hey guys, you're not in our community and you know, you're not, you're not using it to, and increase the knowledge in our community, you know, and so um, I'd, I'd like to ask you to stop using it. And, and in some cases, they were a competitor. And I and and I even said, um, I will pay for your social media manager to spend the time to remove our hashtag from your posts. And it was very interesting, the response I got. I got a very negative response, like, you know, anyone can use hashtags and like, why can't we use it, you know? And um, and and then I got this question of then actually, apparently there was a conversation, um, a different conversation that was happening amongst people who had seen had gotten that response from me saying, oh, well, maybe we should use the hashtag more. So she'll pay us <laughs> to remove it. Oh my and, goodness. you know, I thought I'm just I'm you know, it is what it is. But I, I think, you know, hashtags are hashtags. Anyone can use them. Uh, but realistically, um, the, if they are branded, they're somebody's hashtag, you know, and it's brand name. Yeah, it's your brand name. They're using your yeah. brand. Name. It's not. I would not even think of it as a hashtag. They're using your brand name, which I guess you've trademarked. So, well, yeah. that's that's the next move. We do need to trademark it, and that's it's what it's on our list of things to do in 2021. I think when you set up a business, you don't think you don't know if it's going to take off or not, right? You don't know if anyone's going to like it or want it, and you know, you think, well, I don't necessarily need to do that. But then, as you get bigger, you do need to you know, lawyer up, if you will, but I always suggest, that's something I would suggest is I, I trademarked mine immediately before I even launched. And I would suggest everyone do that. So your brand name and any slogan you have before you even launch, it should be one of the first things you do uh, to protect yourself, but also to check no one else already actually owns it and that you're going to launch a business the whether someone else is going to go, Oi, that's mine. Um, yeah. I would definitely say do that straight away. No, that's so true. And actually, that's, um, that's great advice. And I think, and one thing I did do was I, do, I mean, I double checked that no one had ever used the word before. And we are the only people who ever used the word. So that was good. But I do. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And I think my next call after this is going to be to sort that out. But no, you know, I think it's really important to respect other people's brands. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think if, you know, if, if, if you're in the same, um, if you're in the same industry or the same, you know, you're you're competing against each other, you can compete with a friendly face and you can complete compete in a nice way. But, you know, uh, hijacking a hashtag isn't usually the best way to do that. A, a funny story about hijacking a hashtag, though, is one of our hashtags, which we don't use anymore. Um, kind of every couple of years, we have a new theme. We've been stuck on the be brave and sparkle theme for a while because I think everyone's needed to be brave in this this environment. But um, and that's been a really good one. But before that, we had a hashtag that was um, bring back the sparkle. That was one of the very first hashtags that we used. And it got hijacked by an oven cleaning company. Yeah. <laughs> and so now if you go and look, bring back the sparkle, you'll find jewelry and ovens, which is fine. And it's great. And we've moved on. But it is, um, you know, there's there's different ways to to work with a hashtag. And you do have to be careful not to uh, use a branded hashtag because. Uh, mm -hmm you know, that doesn't really help your reputation. So you've ta you've talked about some amazing uh, things that came your way, like Robbie Williams wearing your stuff and also some challenges that you had where someone stole your slogan. Um, what's been the best part of this whole journey? I think the best part for me is the relationships that I've built with families that are going through really hard times. So one. Um, one of the best moments is there's a little video on my Instagram and it's a little boy called Freddie and he has cerebral palsy and he was going on an unaided walk. So he usually used a walker 
And then before he went on his unaided walk, he pressed his superpower button to give him the powers to walk. And off he went. And his mum posted on Instagram and tagged me. And I was just bawling, crying, going, oh, my goodness, it's working. It's helping these kids feel stronger and braver. And and it's the stories of the kids who are benefiting from our, these are us, these are our little sleep buddies. So from our little superhero sleep buddies and on the back, there's the pocket where you can put photographs. And Oh, I love that. I get from parents who show me pictures as I'm going to sleep, snuggling them, the picture of their parent who's recently passed away in the back and just saying it's really helping. And the the parents who have in, kids in hospital who we send these to and we work with Great Ormond Street and they always have sleep buddies so they can give them to whoever needs one. And I think that's the... That's the bit that means the most to me because it's the bit that that's the reason I set up the brand. And that's I know now that if I found myself at those pearly gates again, that I would think I have done good. I have, I have helped people. And I've, we've got loads of new campaigns happening Like this year. We're going to be working with Click Sergeant, which is an amazing um, cancer charity for children. And one bit that really got my heart. They have these houses across the country where parents can sleep and live basically while their kids are having treatment. So, for example, if you live in Cornwall and your kid's having a cancer treatment, it can take four months and you can't you just can't travel five hours over there and five hours back. Or it's me guessing geography um, from the hospital if the hospital's Bristol. So they've they've set up a house where the parents can live for four months if they need to so that they're right next to the hospital. And it's free. It, they, the, those parents don't have to pay anything. And that taking that worry off your mind when I've I've built relationships with so many parents who there's a particular cancer called neuroblastoma. And it's one where the, you don't get enough treatment here. If, you, if certain levels, I don't want to get the, the um, science wrong, but so many of those kids need to raise half a million pounds in order to get treatment abroad because there's certain treatment abroad that, that is the be their best chance. And I try and help them raise that money. So we use our community, our all very kind hearted community. If I call out these kids and say, this kid, you imagine as a parent, and especially if you've never used social media before, you're told you've got to raise half a million pounds to save your ch child's life. It's horrendous and so daunting and so scary. So I'll always try and, and promote them and say that this is what's happening, if anyone can help. And my, like my community is so amazing. They raised like twelve thousand pounds in one night for a child. Wow! You're like, oh, it, but any any charities that are helping these people in the worst situation where you've just found out your kid's really ill, I want to help them and I want to support them. So we're going to be launching um, a collection soon that's raising money for Click Sergeant to help these houses fund these houses, and we're also going to be helping them with various other things. They give packs out to kids that we're going to be helping with those as well. So just always always looking for ways that we can help. We also have our super scarves, so that's to help the, the mothers of children. Because I think the mothers of poorly children can be forgotten. It's a very lonely world. I think when your child's first diagnosed, you get lots of sympathy. Everyone's like, oh my goodness, are you okay? What's going on? And then it carries on, can carry on for years, and you can feel very alone. And so we launched our super scarves campaign where for every scarf sold, one was donated to a woman with cancer or the mother of a child with cancer. And it can be any serious illness. It doesn't have to be um, actual cancer. And that the, the messages I get back from women who say, I, I just you've just lifted me so much because you they've received this scarf through the post and a little letter from me saying, you know, I hope it brings you some comfort and you've been nominated to receive this. And I just think it makes a bit of a difference. And even if it puts a smile on their face for one minute, it's better than not at all. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I want to, Padma, who's one of our community, one of our vibrant members of our community, she says, your superheroes that you kindly sent to my friends are helping so much. Thank you. Um, and April, who's watching as well, says these charities do wonderful work. Yeah. Uh, and she says that this has brightened up my morning, much needed at the moment in the midst of lockdown 3.0. I mean, it's so needed right now. And I just love the fact that, you know, it's it's really true. We we do need those superpowers right now because, you know, it, it's uh, it's one of those situations where you can't go anywhere, you can't do anything, and you've got to keep yourself motivated. You've got to get yourself dressed every morning. You've got to get yourself moving and going and, 
you know, and I think um, one of the things that does help is if you have if you have a business and, and you you know that that business brings happiness uh, to people, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's just a wonderful thing uh, and and also changes people's lives in such a positive way. Um, there, this has been such a lovely morning and there's so many great uh, learnings from this. Um, what do you think just, uh, in terms of, you know, your, your number one social media network, I, I'm assuming is Instagram. Is that the case? 100%. Yeah. I'm Instagram's so important to us. I, I personally enjoy it the most. Um, I do think I've neglected the other channels a lot because <laughs> I've been trying to do it myself. And I think this is another reason why I'm getting some help now so that I can have someone else running Facebook, so Facebook has its own content and not just reposting what I post on Instagram and also starting a Pinterest because we don't have a scamp and do Pinterest and we need one. So and I'm really excited to have someone else get involved because I, I got to the point where I'm going, oh my goodness, what am I posting tonight? I've got to do a, and, and it didn't used to be like that. It used to be a bit more organic. And now I'm so busy designing the collections and running the business and putting campaigns together, not to forget homeschooling. Let's talk about homeschooling so oh yeah that thing <laughs> I just need a little bit of help now and I think we've got to the point four four years in that I'm just looking and going which bits which bits of my life am I finding a little bit too much now and social media has grown so much the messages are as we get so many dms and so many comments that I, can't, I just don't get time to reply to so yeah it's time to have a little bit of help and we will make more of an effort on Facebook and Pinterest moving forward but I think what's interesting is because you are so close to Instagram, I, I would love if you can, um, and I know eventually it won't be the thing you do all the time uh, and are the only person doing it, but what what is the one or two things that are really, really working for you for Instagram? So, well, I think regular content is definitely some, some really important. I've had brands reach out to me and say can you help me like we're, we're just not getting any engagement and I'll look and they've done two posts in a week and I'm like well that's why you've got to I think it's best to post every single day I mean I'll post twice a day sometimes keep that keep the conversation going keep the excitement make sure all your images are on brand and fit and it's it's interesting it's not just salesy and selling something that there's something to talk about and starts a conversation and Try and make your feed a happy feed, like uplifting, and it makes people smile and makes people want to come come to you. And I think, I think, I think they're probably the the main things I would say. And making sure you connect with people, the right people who might be able to share your brand as well. And but also think what how you can help them. I think that's the other thing. People can just send you things and expect you to post something. Like I get stuff sent to me, and then people are chasing me on. When am I going to post it? And I'm a bit like, I never said I was going to post it. Like, you, you know, you can't just send someone something and then expect them to post it. You've got to build a relationship with that person and see if they actually want the product and if it's something that would fit in their lives and they would like to use. And then you hope for the best that you might get a post, but you can't be, you just can't be like that. I think that's, um, that can be quite tricksy. And Rosalind said, I love that you should make your feed a happy feed. I think especially in these days, you need to have a happy feed because, and it doesn't mean that it has to be a perfect feed, everything's perfect, but I do think, you know, right now people are gravitating towards things that make them feel good yeah. and encourage them. So I think that's really important. Um, there have been a few questions that came up on the live podcast. Um, and now I know manufacturing enough to know that people don't share their secrets as to where they, you know, who they're using or where they use them. But I do know that it's important when you are, building a, a physical product that you um, that you find the right manufacturer for you. Do you have any tips on that for people who want to go down the clothing route, how to find a manufacturer that works for them? Yeah, I, I, there's a really great company called, is it Make It British or Made It British? Something along those lines. And it's a, it's a trade show. And it's all, these are all British manufacturers, but there are other trade shows as well that have um, kind of checked manufacturers so you know that they're going to be decent manufacturers that go and show there and you can go and meet them and talk to them and see their work that's one way um well, things i say the most important things which some people don't necessarily check there are certain reports that, that you must get on your factories 
So I went to meet my factory. Um, it's in Portugal. And I went to meet them and walk around the factory. And I made sure they had all the right reports that showed that they were ethical, fair, paying their staff fairly, nice working conditions. And um, also that the safety and obviously, you, you know, you hear these horrendous stories about child labor and you're like, it can haunt you even the thought of that possibly happening. Um, so you get it, these reports are called a Smeta report and you just make sure you get a Smeta report from that factory. And and then it's the case of I've worked with I worked with a different factory in Portugal for a, a couple of things as well. And they really weren't great. And the, there were things that went wrong and the quality wasn't great. And even when you can go there and it's a spanking, flashy factory and it looks great, the product, you can be really disappointed. So it's it can be a little bit hit and miss, um, but the factory, the main factory we use is the one we I launched with. So we've been with them right from the start. Yeah, you never put on your factory details because for the reason being, it's not like some weird cloak and dagger thing. For the reason being, your factory, like my factory is so busy and there are delays all over the place at the moment that I wouldn't want them to have another brand to work on because my delays would be even more. And we've, we've, we have such huge volumes of product now with them that they're almost struggling to keep up with the demand the demand that we're supplying them so i wouldn't want them to have less time for me so i think there are ways that there, yeah it's difficult people don't want to share their their own factories um, well, I, when i first found out i did realize that i was like oh this is um why won't anyone tell me their factory and now i'm like okay i get it yeah because <laughs> they don't want to lose their factory exactly. um, Paula does all of our Tech Pixie fab boxes, which you can see in the back. We've got, you know, um, we do uh, face masks and, um, you know, the, the scarves and all that stuff. And so she says she got her, Portugal is where she gets most of her garments. It's ethical Ooh. supply. So, yeah. So there you go. Portugal is a good place if you're going to get into the clothing business. Yeah. But actually now with them. Um with the Brexit, it's I would definitely suggest looking for UK-based um, suppliers as well. I mean, when I was looking, when we when we first launched, I was looking, but I couldn't find because I was just looking specifically for kids wear. It was more limited, and I just couldn't find the quality that I wanted. Like the fact I did find one factory, they had massive lead times. They couldn't even do start my production for a year, which I couldn't do either. But it, they felt it just felt flimsy as well. It didn't the quality from Portugal. It's such amazing cotton. No, I, 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 when I, so when we were going on that panel together, I thought I'm going to go on her website and I'm going to look and see if she's got any star products. You had one star product at the time, which I'm thrilled by the way that you've introduced an entire line because it gives me clothes to wear every day. But I, um, I went and bought the one sweater you had at the time and I literally put it on and I said that night, I'm like, I'll never take this off because it was the most comfortable sweatshirt I had ever put on in my entire life. And, and, yeah. you know, one of the reasons I love wearing it is because it's just comfortable and it's, it's but I'm sure there are factories in the UK that I just didn't find that can do as good a job. Um, I think it's definitely worth looking there first. So Google Made in British or Make It British and you'll find them. And it's a brilliant it's a brilliant website. You can sign up and they can, they, if you can pay for a list of suppliers in the UK um, and they can kind of encourage you. They want to encourage pe more people to make things in the UK. So they're really helpful. Yeah, and you can use um, kind of drop shipping or print on demand. And we do that for my daughter. So my daughter wants to, uh, she wanted to do horse riding lessons. And I try and, you know, being the entrepreneurial mom I am, I said, well, great, you can set up a shop online and sell sweatshirts with horses on it. And that's how you can fund your horse riding experience. <laughs> um, so she did, she did. She set up, uh, she and her friends did the designs and we did the actual build of the Shopify shop. We've had a couple sales, which has been fun and we haven't really taken it super seriously, but we at least started to understand that concept. And that's what we did. I looked for a British drop shipping company, a British print on demand company. And we did get, um, and the first sample that we got back that we tried was actually um, not from Britain. It was from the US very strangely. And it was because um, we didn't know what we were doing and it was awful. And then when we sent off, then we switched to this British company and they sent it through and it was really, really nice. So it does make a difference and it's worth trying those different samples. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important. Um, Katie Cooper is watching uh, and her sister actually is our, C our CMO at Tech Pixies, which is uh, our chief marketing officer. And 
obviously huge Pinterest experts. Um, her s sister Pip, when she was going through our programs, she said, you don't have a Pinterest module. I want to create it. She went out and created it and then became a Pinterest as expert. But they um, absolutely love you. And they said you have such a great ethos and that you must get on Pinterest. So they yeah. completely agree that that's the way forwards for you. <laughs> Definitely to do on the list. Um, we have to, we definitely have to close with this question. I think this is a great question. Do you have a few more minutes you can spare with us? Um, Abigail wants to know, how do you do it all? You're amazing. Any good habits you can share? And I think it's, it's easy sometimes to look on the outside and think everything must be running smoothly and you don't have any temper tantrums at home related to <laughs> homeschooling and everything else. But, you know, what are your top tips for kind of managing it all? Because it is hard. And do you have help? I think it's very much a, um, you know, when people say about a duck on the top of the surface like this, and then underneath they're like that. I'm definitely one of those. So, I, I mean, I have a great team now. So when I, I was definitely more stressed and frantic this time two years ago, um, whereas now I've built a team and I feel so much calmer since I've got a really great team who are helping me and are part of the gang and are, are just, and I respect what they do, what they bring to the company. And also a big change for me was moving out of London. So we moved out, out of London 18 months ago. Great timing because we literally got here like six months before um, the pandemic. And that's made such a difference to, I used to, in, when I was in London, I love London and I always will love London and I do miss bits. But I felt very tight chested all the time. Everything was really manic. Sunny school was like 20 minute drive away and I'd have to I'd always be in an absolute panic about everything. And I was stressed. I was stressed. And then we moved out here and we've got more space in the house. So I've got a, a bigger office. So I've got space. I've got design tables. And it's just, I feel lighter and more space outside. Um, we had a duck nesting on our pond in the spring. <laughs> Actually built a nest and had eggs. You know, I was, I mean, for me, I was like, this is like the best day of my life. There's a duck nesting on the pond. And having that outside your window when you're working and being able to walk up country walks, and I that's that's been a big difference for me. My husband has works has his own business and he works from home too. So we've and my kids now go to school literally around the corner. So it, everything has just calmed down and everything has got to a much better place where I feel so much calmer and so much more like I can cope and I can do this. One big thing that I, I changed was when the kids get home from school, so they'll often have clubs um, after school, so I'll pick them up, might be about five or something. Um, I don't try and carry on working until they're in bed. I'll finish anything once they've gone to bed. So when they're back, office door is shut, focus on them, have some time with them, enjoy them. And then once they've gone to bed, carry on with anything you need to do. And that's someone gave me that advice a couple of years ago. And it made such a massive difference because I was just going, I just can't do, I can't do all of this. This is crazy. Yeah, I think it's trying to do the two at the same time. That's really hard. Um, I know that, you know, my kids for Christmas last year gave me a book called Make Time. <laughs> I thought maybe that's a sign that I should be be able to shot and it's but it's actually really hard I, I tried to explain to someone um once well a coach of mine who really did help me manage my time um but I was trying to explain to her what it was like and I said it's when you're working on your business it's literally like and then you walk into family life it's like it's like being a frozen chicken you know it's like taking a whole frozen chicken out of the freezer and putting it into the kitchen and it's like until you learn how to shut off work and be with family uh you're kind of you're never really you're never really either you know you're never really able to do that and um and it's interesting because uh, when i was doing archery training i learned how to when i was an archer on the us arch team i learned how to block off noise so from a very early age when they were little i could just literally just block them off and focus and that that actually didn't serve very well for anyone but it was very interesting because they they ended up having to get to a point where they a point where they point where they'd say, "Mommy, I'm talking to you," and then you'd be like, "Oh, okay, I can focus." Um, but it, I do think it's very tricky uh, being a, a founder at home with your kids and trying to run a, a a business that's successful and that takes a lot of your time, but also to be equally there. But it's really important. So, you know, I think that your points are really really valid. I heard somebody else say that 
from, I think it was, um, you know, again, that five o'clock to eight o'clock period, just everything's off, phones off, computers off. And, you know, and if there's something really, really urgent um, that they've got, you know, a special home phone line that they can call or whatever. And it is about that self-discipline and it is, it's not easy, you know, and, and I know that, um, that I, I, don't do it every day the way that I should. But one thing that I learned how to do was how to shut, and this sounds like such a simple thing, but I shut the computer. Like I actually, because I used to leave the computer lid open all the time. And what I learned is that if I just shut the top, then it's actually an effort to open it back up again, start all the systems up again. And so, um, you know, that seems to be helping, but it is really, really tricky. But yeah, I think it's really important to, to find that balance. And are you, do you do a morning routine? A lot of, a lot of people who, you know, do you have a time to do some journaling or do some fitness or do some meditation? Um, that was one of my um, New Year's resolutions was I was going to start doing something for myself and look after myself because I, I do nothing for myself. I work and I look after the kids and that's, that's my life. <laughs> so I said, I'm going to do something. And I did a collaboration with Elemis and the founder of Elemis said to me, she's like, right. I did a, um, a Zoom interview with her and on it when I was saying, admitting that I don't do anything, she said, I'm gonna make you join this Pilates class with me it's twice a week where it's a Zoom Pilates class and you're gonna do it. So I was like, okay. And I signed up and I was like, but it's at five o'clock. Um, and by the time it gets to five o'clock and I've done, a ho had Jude, my youngest is normally sat in here with me, he's six. So he needs a lot of help going through, well, focusing on actually what he's doing. Because otherwise he'll just be going, looking around. You're like, maybe you're doing maths. Come on. And I'm trying to work at the same time. They finish. It's about three when they finish. So I'm like, right, you can go and play. And then I'm desperately trying to get work done. So five o'clock comes. I have a banging headache. I'm like, the last thing I feel like doing is going and doing Pilates. I'm like, I feel like a glass of wine. And just, and just I mean, there's no way. So I've not done it. So I need to rethink that and maybe do something first thing in the morning, but not not while homeschool schooling is going on because the morning I've got to get them ready for to be online at, at nine. So it's not. Yeah, fun. well, the book that I read that I loved. Um, well, there's two books. I love The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. And she talks about, uh, you know, the morning routine. And I also like the book um, The Morning, The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. And he did a uh, he did a documentary as well that you can get, uh, I think, on Amazon Prime. I'm not sure, but I know I was able to um, purchase it for my team and I gave it to everybody for Christmas or well, for New Year's. I said, you know, here's the miracle morning. But, you know, it's it's interesting because um, it takes a, anytime you, you know, we, we run our life fully on habit. So anytime you want to change a habit, you really have to make that effort to change that initial habit. But once it becomes a routine, then it's a lot easier to maintain. Uh I'm going to let you go because otherwise I'll never let you go because you're just amazing. And I love talking to you and I love your story and I love your energy and your vibe. There's one last question, uh, which is where can I get the new top that Joe is wearing? Cause I can't find it on the website. <laughs> I will. It's not, it's not launched yet. Let me tell you when it's launching. It arrives. I think it's going to be the 22nd of February and it also okay. comes, this is a black one. It also comes in um, Navy and gray as well. And and I've got plain joggers to go with it, like thicker joggers, warmer joggers, because our, our other joggers are quite lightweight. I did that to make them as flattering as possible. Um, but I've done some thicker joggers. I worked very hard to make flattering thicker joggers. Because most joggers, thicker joggers, can make you look a little larger than you are, I've found anyway, because I've got quite reasonable size thighs and bottom. And so finding joggers that actually look nice on me has been quite a feat. And I've done it. So I think this is why everyone loves our joggers is because they work for all shapes and sizes. Um, and it's all about it's all about the little things that we can that, that I've done and the little tweaks to make them flattering joggers. Well, so just repeat that date again so we know when we can get these brand new joggers. 22nd of February. OK, so mark it on your calendar, Karen. She's going to be your first buyer. If you sign up for the newsletter on the site, I always let our subscribers know first when things arrive. So you'll find out before the Instagram stampede um, if you sign up for the newsletter. Yeah, and, and you know what? And that's a great place to stop because one of the things that we're really encouraging people to do is as they're building up their social media following, encouraging people to join their mailing list. Most uh, product-based businesses offer a discount in order to join the mailing list. Is that what you do or do you do something different? 
we do a discount for first orders so but if you sign up yeah you get it you it's counted as your first order so yeah that's amazing well thanks so much for your time i am gonna let you go but i don't want to i absolutely love hanging out with you um i really enjoyed meeting you the first time and we have talked before lockdown about getting together and then we just couldn't make it happen because lockdown happened so uh, anyway one day we will actually have that dinner yes exactly it was lovely to talk to you lovely to talk to you thank you for your time bye